Hello and welcome to Money News on Newsmax TV. I'm John Bachman. Joining me right now from the UK is Dr. Peter Warburton. He is the director of Economic Perspectives, a consulting firm based in the UK. He is also the author of Debt and Delusion, Central Bank Follies that Threaten Economic Disaster. Dr. Warburton, it's great to talk to you again. Many thanks. All right, so I want to talk first about these Chinese uh, market reforms that were announced late last week. There was uh, some vague information put out there at first, but we got some more specifics uh, on some huge changes uh, that could take place over in China. Uh, we've talked about this in the past. There has been, you know, kind of a glacial pace of progress on, an, on a number of fronts. But do you find these uh, new reforms that have been announced encouraging? I do. I, I think the, um, the key um, sort of statement really is that they're going to allow private enterprise to play a bigger role, and I think that's um, immensely positive. I think the last five years, I think, have seen uh, private enterprise uh, forced onto the back foot, and uh, uh, I think in the wake of, of the crisis five years ago, um, China clo closed up. I think, um, you know, this sounds like, uh, um, you know, the, the end of, of, of that phase. So, so, that, so the thrust of the document is is more open and more, um, I think, sort of conducive to uh, for reforms. I mean, the, the the place where this is most evident, obviously, is in financial liberalisation. Um, you know, China still has a long way to go, um, but it, but I think it has a definite track here. Other reforms uh, are going to take a lot more time, um, but the one-child policy being relaxed, I think that, that's immensely um, positive. I read some place uh, talking about the one-child policy and the changes there. Just think about the diapers uh, and the baby formula alone that China is going to need. Now, what is really driving uh, this change? Because it did seem like for a while that China was maybe moving in the other direction, uh, and now it's you know definitely at least appears to be moving to more free market principles. What is the real driver behind this uh, you know cataclysmic shift here? <clears throat> well, I think it's a recognition that um, you know when you have a a managed or you know a, a kind of a, a directed economic system that it makes lots of bad decisions and uh, it, essentially it destroys value um, and you can be a very wealthy economy and a huge economy like China um, but in time you know um, if you keep on misallocating resources um, you know then everybody will lose out so you know I, I think um, it hasn't come to a point of crisis but I think if you run on this track another couple of years and, and you allow, you know, kind of crazy projects to run wild and what happens every December is that budgets just splurge out to fill up their allocations and, um, you know, you end up with some very poor decision making. And I think this is about trying to discipline, um, you know, the, 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 um, the use of resources in the economy. And so this is going to open China up to a lot more of imports. A lot of countries are going to be looking to uh, get even more into the Chinese uh, markets there. So who are, who are the countries that are best suited to benefit uh, from this more uh, open economic policy that China seems to be pursuing? Yeah, I, I mean, I think um, China's you know, immediate neighbors um, obviously, um, I think, have, have the most to gain. But I, I think the thing is that the expansion of Chinese travel and tourism um, you know, it will be, be another expression of this of this openness, and you know, all the the aircraft that you know, um, passenger aircraft that China has been ordering. Um, you know, I, I think it prepares for many more Chinese to to travel, and and um, you know, and I, I I think you know, Europe and America will um, you know potentially share share in that bonanza. But I mean, if we if you're talking about specific beneficiaries, then. Um, you know, I, I, I guess, um, you know, Taiwan and, and Hong Kong, um, are, you know, are clearly, you know, best, best positioned for, um, um, for that trade. Uh, the trade deficit w with the U.S. Uh, and the, U the European Union is, is not what it once was. Um, but how should investors look at this if, if they want to try to capitalize on uh, China's uh, liberalization of its economic policies? <clears throat> I think, you know, China is such a, a huge um, economy. I, I think the, 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 the thing to focus really on is that um, even this year, when the Chinese equity market, you know, is barely, uh, it's barely up on the year, you know, as opposed to the S&P, which is up about 25%. Um, but 
within that, there have been some remarkable growth stories, and I, and I think it's really a stock picker's paradise. And obviously, there are some China funds that uh, um, you know ha have put in a very good shift this year. Um, but I mean, just to give an example, that internet sales in China are growing 40% per annum right now. Um, so you know, so online distribution, the online consumer, um, if you're plugged into that channel, then you should be doing pretty well. And so that's one area. But what are some of the you know potential downsides of this? We've talked in the past about um, inflation, and what does this all mean for inflation? Yeah, China China's still trying to grow at seven percent a year, and that's too fast. Uh, I think almost everyone agrees that the sustainable pace of growth is slowing and may already be only around five percent. Um, you know, if you try and charge ahead too fast, the danger is a that you know that they'll, China will slip into um, you know really having slack um, policies again. Um, but I, it does mean that there's likely to be upward pressure on inflation. Um, inflation in China is recorded at 3.2 percent. Um, that's quite a bit higher than a year ago. Um, I think if we if we saw inflation through 4 percent, um, then then it would need to provoke some kind of reaction. And there's also a potential uh, side effect here for the U.S. dollar. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, the the Chinese currency is you know is even has been even stronger than than the U.S. dollar over the last couple of years. Um, however, um, um, China doesn't at the moment seem to be ready to take any action to to, to prevent it, its currency uh, appreciating. Um, you know what? What I my concern actually is that um, there's still a lot of uncertainty over how um, you know the Fed will operate um, under uh, its new chairman uh, Janet Yellen. Um, you know, I, I think that you know that we, we may have a, a more unsettled time for the dollar. So what this would mean is that uh, uh, you know costs coming out of Asia, um, you know, might might actually represent as um, as higher import price inflation in America in, 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 a, in a weaker dollar scenario. So the, so the Chinese imports might cost a little bit more, uh, but that will also mean that U.S. exports to China would be in a better position as well, correct? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't think China has, has really sort of put up any great barriers. I think that the, um, every now and again, China figures out how to do something that it was importing before, and it just basically replaces an external source of supply with a domestic one and um, you know so if you're chi if you're Japan or Germany you probably feel more threatened by that than uh, uh, perhaps you know than currently uh, than America does um, but but look I mean the the diversity of tastes of Chinese consumers um, I think plays well you know in, into the Western offering um, obviously there have been food safety concerns um, and I'm told if you go into um, you know a kind of a um, a full scale supermarket in China where you can buy Western goods, they're really quite expensive. You know, so um, you know I think there, there's there's definitely scope for more more players to you know maybe sort of compete um, in the Chinese supermarkets. Yeah, and that fact is uh, underscored by the uh, Smithfield ham deal that just uh, went through. Uh, the Chinese are spending a lot of money to uh, buy some American-made ham. Let's stay in Asia, but I want to shift topics a little bit and talk about uh, what you saw on your recent trip overseas when you were in Malaysia. Uh, and there is a, an influx of money going into these uh, Islamic um, Sharia law uh, you know, focused funds. Uh, and where is this money, uh, where has this money in the past been invested and why is, this, is, why is Malaysia now such an attractive target uh, for these Islamic-focused uh, investment funds? Yeah, I mean, the, um, the path of Islamic finance has not run smoothly. Um, it has to, to be said that, you know, I mean, as far back as 1978, um, you know, Kuwait built a financial sector and, and you know, basically it, it ended in a crash and disintegrations. So there have been a number of attempts, you know, to, um, to build up um, Islamic finance, but I think Malaysia is making, um, I think, a, a much stronger case. So, just to put it in perspective, um, the amount of kind of assets invested under a, a kind of Islamic wrapper is about two trillion U.S. dollars right now. Um, but it's growing rapidly, and um, um, these bonds they call sukuk bonds um, that Malaysia issued about 130 billion U.S. dollar last last year. 
um, and, that, and that was you know um, a massive increase on previous years. Um, it does seem that more and more Middle Eastern wealth that perhaps you know previously was invested in the in the U.S. Treasury market and, and European bond markets, it's now investing in um, you know in in, in Islamic um, kind of bonds. Um, which, which are matched with infrastructure projects, um, for example. Yeah, no, there's the infrastructure projects, and, and some folks who, who watch financial television may have seen uh, Malaysia advertising very heavily as a good place to invest money. But does, does the bulk of that money that's being invested, that $2 trillion you talked about, does that stay uh, in Malaysia, or where else might that money be going? Um, quite a bit of money does leave, and ba basically Malaysia, um, you know, Malaysia's successful companies need to expand outside the country. So, so actually, um, you know, there's probably more um, investment of Malaysian companies outside the country than there is of foreign investments now in Malaysia. So, um, but it, that's just really a reflection of, um, you know, that the Malaysian market is too small uh, for some of its um, for some of its in in incumbents. You know, like the the, the sort of the palm oil companies and and the the, uh, the energy companies. So, um, you know, there is a spillover in in you know, but I think it's mainly within within the Southeast Asian region. Now, you can look at this a couple of ways. If I'm an investor and I look at this uh, Malaysian market as a, an emerging opportunity, maybe I'm um, somewhat attracted to it. But at the same time, we're kind of uh, you know taking this all into account as we look at some geo political uh, things that are going on right now, and there's this potential that sanctions could be lessened against Iran. If I'm investing in these Malaysian Islamic funds, is there any chance that if those sanctions are lifted that some of that money could go uh, to Iran? Because certainly I think there are a lot of folks here in the West in America that don't want to support Iran in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think it, it, it's, it's still quite a remote po you know, possibility. The Iranian economy has been chaotic. You know, I, I think um, obviously, um, you know, the, there has been a desire to keep access to motor fuel um, very, very cheap in Iran. Even you know, after they, you know, they, they needed to import other grades in order to uh, facilitate that. Um, but I mean, at various times in the last year, Iran has had horrendous inflation and you know, and, and shortages. Um, so I would say that. It, uh, um, you know, it, it would only be very friendly money um, coming to Iran right now. It, it doesn't really stack up, um, you know, a, a, as a destination for investment. Fair enough. And I asked that question because uh, just last week, uh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu indicated that there were investors just lining up, waiting to get into Iran if those sanctions were lifted. But there's a lot of factors in play in all that. Maybe an outside shot, but worth talking about anyway. Dr. Peter Warburton, thank you very much for joining us here on Money News. Always a pleasure to talk to you uh, and stay warm over there in London. Many thanks. And thank you for watching Money News on Newsmax TV.